nice to have you here in Palmstedtsalen for this um, activity that we will have the last point of the Chalmers Sustainability Day. So we have an interesting program in this room here. We will have a focus on hydrogen and we will have focus on the Fulbright. So my name is Maria Gran. I'm the director of Energy Area of Advance, which is a platform here at Chalmers focusing on collaboration activities around the energy topic. So first I would like to introduce um, our director of uh, Chalmers, CEO of Chalmers, Stefan Bengtsson, and you will start this activity for today. Okay, thank you, Maria. So I'm Stefan Bengtsson, and I'm the president of Chalmers. And of course, it's uh, my uh, pleasure to welcome you all to this afternoon of seminars uh, connected to uh, the Fulbright Distinguished Chair in Alternative Energy Technology. And in particular, of course, uh, very much welcome to all of the uh, Fulbright scholars that are here um, and, uh, and, and the people from the Fulbright Commission. We really appreciate the collaboration we have with Fulbright. Uh, I think we have done uh, some amazing things over the last years together uh, um, between Sweden and, and Fulbright, and, and we put, should look for strengthening uh, the activities in the forthcoming. And connected to the uh, alternative energy technology uh, share, of course, also I would like to uh, express our appreciation to, uh, to Marianne and Marcus Wallenberg Foundation that has supported a part of this over, over many years. Chalmers uh, University of Technology, we have the University of Engineering, Science, Architecture, and, and related, some related topics, 10,000 students, uh, 3,000 employees, roughly 75 percent of our activity financial, in financial terms is research and doctorate education. Um, Chalmers for a sustainable future is our vision and we, we really work with sustainability. All our students have compulsory education in sustainability and we, uh, we stimulate and ask of course all our staff to re reflect upon sustainability uh, in all of their activities and what they're doing. We have built our university in a sort of matrix structure. Maria mentioned here the energy area of advance and we have a number of these cross-cutting initiatives going across our departments to support more uh, multidisciplinary collaboration and to build platforms for uh, industrial collaboration. Uh, Chalmers for Sustainable Future, yes. Today is the Chalmers Sustainability Day. So there have been lectures uh, over the day here and, and uh, at during the Sustainability Day that we have regularly, Chalmers employees and students meet to reflect and learn ab about sustainability issues. This year, the uh, day is focused on the SDGs 9, 11 and 12 with a particular focus on circular economy. Uh, and um, uh, that fits, of course, extremely well with this lecture this afternoon, which uh, is really describing important concepts for sustainable energy systems. Uh, so we will have this afternoon uh, three presentations. Uh, we will have f first, uh, well, the main presenter is our new distinguished chair, Fulbright Distinguished Chair, David Leishman, uh, and uh, a professor at California State University, Los Angeles, and uh, technical director of the Hydrogen Research and Fueling Facility. Uh, David will spend the coming year here at Chalmers. We are really happy to have you here uh, and look forward to collaborate with you. Uh, and today he will give his inaugural lecture with the title, If You Build It, He Will Come, focusing on hydrogen infrastructure. But before we, we leave the floor to, to David, uh, Sonja Ye, professor here at Chalmers at the Division of Physical Resource Theory at the Department of Space, Earth and Environment, will give a presentation. Uh, so where is Sonja? There, there you are. <laughs> Uh, she, came from, uh, she came to Chalmers from uh, uh, UC Davis uh, in California and had the Fulbright Distinguished Chair position here three years ago. She stayed. Fantastic. <laughs> she will reflect, up, uh, reflect about the Fulbright program, the experiences you made through this, and we look forward to that, of course. And then 
then following Sonia, David will give his speech, and then we have a final presentation, uh, which will be given online directly from California. It's the director of California Fuel Cell Partnership, Bill Elric, and he will share his views on hydrogen development from a California perspective. So to all of you, again, very much welcome to this afternoon. I look forward to hearing to your presentation. So please, Sonia, the floor is yours. Thank you. Okay, good. So it's good to see everyone here, see the new Fulbrighter this year. Very, very warm welcome. Um, I will reflect very briefly about my, oops, is there a clicker? Yes, uh, my year uh, as a Fulbright professor, very briefly, um, in 2015, 2016, and then I'll talk mostly about my current research. Um, so as I mentioned, I'm the Fulbright professor, 2015 and 2016. And during that year, I really, really enjoyed that experience. And as most of the Fulbrighters you know, that we start a visit at the uh, city council in Stockholm. And at the December, we have the Nobel ceremony, me and my son. Um, and we had a Thomas Day. It was, this was a uh, Thomas Day in 2015. And then I gave also gave a lecture as a Fulbright professor at Thomas. And then we graduate in the summer. So that was a very good, my year um, as a Fulbright professor at Thomas. And it was, of course, a very wonderful experience. And as you probably most of you know that I stay on as a professor at trauma. So I, um, well, before I go on, um, I, most of the interesting experience I had during the year was invited by the um, embassy in Austria to give a tour in, um, in Austria, met with their energy minister, talked with many energy experts in Austria. Um, this is a collaboration with the embassy and Fulbright in Austria, which is a very big program and um, gave many talks throughout Austria in different universities and uh, in America who said um, about California policy. So my main focus at the time was really about California policy and how do we um, promote clean energy policy and promote greenhouse gas redu reductions in, in California. There were a lot of interest and um, the, uh, the, the ambassador told me that they expect that I would be the last guest they would invite uh, to talk about climate change in the next four years. Because that was December 2016, uh, when we just going to have a president in 2017, January, Donald Trump became, that was the e the month before Donald, Donald Trump will become the first US president. So it was also a very unique experience to talk about California policy on climate change. Um, lots of questions about how the Trump administration will affect the policies and um, energy policy and sustainable policy. Um, and, and, the fight and, and those discussions still going on today, and I can definitely go into details during the Q&A. Um, th those discussions are still extremely relevant today uh, as we, as California, are um, battling these issues about uh, climate regulations uh, with be between the state and the federal agency uh, under the Trump administration. So um, then I move on, become a professor. I got my professorship at Chalmers, and I also got an award from the Volvo Education Foundation uh, um, last year. So it's been um, uh, be extremely grateful uh, to be a Fulbright, and Chalmers give me a home to stay. And um, so I will talk a little bit more about what I have been doing at Chalmers. And I, I um, before I came to Chalmers, uh, the last two years of my, uh, at, in California, I worked on, I, I actually wrote, uh, I wrote a, pr a proposal with, with uh, professors from MIT and Columbia uh, to the National Science Foundation about big data in transportation. It, it didn't get funded. 
And, but I, I really, I was passionate about the idea, so I carried that idea here to Chalmers. And we now we actually got funding from the Swe Swedish Research Council, um, two large fundings, and now I have a team of five people, two PhDs and two postdocs and one research engineer working on big data in transportation. So I will tell you a little bit about uh, what we have been doing. Um, the motivation is really when we do a lot of the scenarios looking to the future, right now I'm part of the IPCC, the Intergovernmental pan inter Panel on Climate Change, looking at future scenarios. Most of the scenarios actually look at, um, use some kind of stylized computational models. As complicated, as fancy they are, they actually look at, use um, one representative decision maker to make decisions for the future. Most of the efforts uh, foc really focus on technologies. There are thousands of descriptions. Maria knows this super well. There are thousands, thousands of lines about uh, description about the future technologies. How much do they cost? What are the performances? And so on and so forth. But there's absolutely no details and no description about people. And and I I got really interested and frustrated at the same time. Why do we ignore people in this decision-making process? And that's primarily because historically we, we're looking at supply technology, building power plants, for, so you don't really think about consumers. But nowadays we talk a lot about alternative vehicles, as you will hear about hydrogen refueling structure, or talk about electric vehicles, or talk about um, mobility of the choice, car sharing, ride sharing. It's all about people making decisions how do you adopt a new technology based on your daily life? And so we want to do, instead of modeling one representative decision maker for the entire world for the next 50 years, we want to look at different people. How do different people make decisions? Because when we think about the future of consumer technologies, especially alternative fuel vehicles, hydrogen, electric vehicles, how people, um, how people move around the space in terms of our daily travel distances, time of a day use of vehicles, um, trip purposes and locations vary a lot and they really matters when you make a decision about whether the new vehicle technology has sufficient range for me to charge, when should I charge and so on and so forth. So the spatial aspects of mobility is important. Then there are also social aspects of mobility is also important about the, what type of housing you're living, whether it's a multi-housing home or it, it, whether you have a garage or not, about your willingness to share, your willingness to wait, how many minutes are you willing to wait for a ride. All those factors, the social and spatial factors are extremely important when we think about alternative future, um, future alternative technologies in transportation. And that's kind of the underlying motivation of what I um, want to do. Uh, I take out, I, I, I start this journey. And the problem is the data is, extru it, it's extremely difficult to get when you start to think about these things. And that's why we start to do uh, the research on big data. So um, ever since we start to have the smartphone, actually before smartphone, when we have a phone, when we use credit card, when you swipe a card, we start the age of, dig you, you leave your signatures, digital signatures about where you are, about um, the location and the time of the people's movement. And there've been a lot of studies using this kind of digital signature to study people's mobility patterns. So you have research like this um, that shows Beijing, shows places, um, basically map out people's digital traces. And that's, that, that's exciting. It, it looks like there's something we can use to understand people's mobility. Um, but the challenge is how do we connect that knowledge to the understanding of how alternative vehicles are adopted. There's a really long journey and we're not there yet, but this is the beginning. Um, of course, working on big data, there, oh, let me de define big data in this case. There are basically three categories of data opportunistic data, so data collected for other purposes. Like I said earlier, whether you're making a call, 
you're using a credit card, your information can be collected and analyzed about your location, about your time, about the time of location. The second is user-generated data, social media data. When you check in, when you log on to Facebook, you leave a digital signature that we can collect and analyze. The third category would be purposely sensed data, traffic data, um, data in a smart city, uh, speed data, and so on and so forth. These are three categories of data that's part of the big data that I mentioned. And of course, there are a lot of challenges working with big data. Privacy is probably the first thing you think about. When I talk about collecting your data, that's probably the first thing you worry about. Indeed, it's extremely important, but I won't discuss them. It, it, so it deserves a separate, separate discussion, but that's, of course, the number one issue. Of course, then they're handling and processing of data, analyzing, interpreting the data. There are a lot of biases in using this type of data, as you can imagine. But probably young people, for example, and the data are not collected like a survey where it's de designed. So we are, instead of like a traditional research method where you think about you think about research question and you collect and analyze data. We are doing the other way around. We are collect. We have a, we have lots and lots of data, but thinking about what is the right research question is almost the most difficult part. So that's the challenges working with big data. Um, um, it's a big. It's a. Sh it's not just about more data. It's a shift in paradigm in research method. But we can combine that with new or traditional research uh, methods in machine learning, artificial intelligence, in physics, in geography. It's a new opportunity for us to do collaboration with other fields. But ultimately, like I said at the beginning, we want to use, use the big data to help us understand how can we develop more realistic scenario to understand the future of energy transitions. And I will show just to show a few examples. Uh, for example, my student have been collecting Twitter data, uh, collecting people's tweet, and try to ask two questions. One is if this data source can be used to represent people's mobility. And the second is what are different types of people, top, can we categorize people based on their behaviors? So in this case, my student has uh, four categories, use machine learning, super, unsupervised learning, identify four categories of people's behaviors based on their network, based on their travel distance, and how frequently they explore new locations. So local explorers, local returners, people have a very centralized location. Uh, local explorer, people go to different places. Global returner, global explorers. Majority of people are in the category of local, local explorers. Um, my student, I'll give a shout out to my student is because actually the, these are four representative people in these four groups and uh, we actually distort the shape so you cannot identify an individual. So if I don't distort, you can actually use this map to identify the single individual. So again, go back to the privacy issue, it's always at the center that we need to take care of the privacy issue. Um, so. These four distinct uh, group of people have different characteristics in terms of uh, distance, trip distances. Of course, global re explorer travel farther away, uh, higher travel distance compared to local travelers. Um, the explorer have fewer, bigger diffusion radius. They explore no more new location more frequently than the returners. And I won't go into detail about the characteristic. I'll just quickly talk about the synthetic population uh, that we're collaborating with University of Virginia and with uh, people from computer science to create synthesized population. That, that basically means that we create people based on their characteristics, whether it's a male or a female, their age and their household characteristics. You have multi-people household, how many kids do you have in a household and create um, their activities and their locations. And we hope to use that to understand how this kind of, with more realistic population and household and behaviors and mobility patterns, we hope to use this kind of tool to better understand um, how transformative technologies, whether it's alternative fuel vehicles, electric vehicle, hydrogen, 
or new shared services like shared mobility or even autonomous vehicles? How can we use that to better understand these important questions about energy transitions in transportation? And that's it. again. Thanks a lot, Sonia, for your sharing your experiences and your also what you are doing right now at Chalmers. So before we hand over for our next speaker, the main speaker for today, I just want to make a little irata, we say in, uh, sometimes in the academic world. Um, if you have spread a link for today that you want to be streaming this um, seminar, it is possible it's direct streaming out, so it could be someone there. I wave to directly somewhere uh, in the world. Um, unfortunately, most of the links that has been spread are the links that has been used for the morning session. And that link is closed. So if you know anyone that relates or relies on the link, please send me an email and I will transfer the right link. Maria.granachalmers.se, you know that. So we can uh, make that as good as possible for now the main uh, activi main occasion for today. David will come soon uh, to speak. Um, otherwise, it will be possible, we heard, to click from the main website at Chalmers to find the right link. But I, have t I haven't tested that myself, so I'm not really sure. And then otherwise, it will be uh, available to find on Monday to be able to see it afterwards. So that's my irata, and we are really sorry about spreading uh, the wrong link. Uh, David has been here um, trying to send the right link to the US. It's early in the morning in the US, but if someone is up and um, could be possible to get the right link on. Anyway, that's time for David. And uh, I repeat again that uh, we are very proud to have you here. And um, we will um, hear more about your activities around hydrogen and especially hydrogen infrastructure. So also please, please present a bit more about yourself when you start. Thank you for coming. All right, let's get started. So um, you probably know that I'm coming from California, more specifically Los Angeles. And when we talk about Los Angeles, you think about what? Santa Monica and Hollywood. So uh, I was thinking, why don't I make a movie night tonight, or this afternoon? So <laughs> we are going to do a little bit of uh, uh, movie watching uh, and talking about movies. and. Also, I'll try to remember that I'm in Sweden, and uh, so there are some Swedish references here as well. So, um, if you build it, he will come is a phrase from one of the Hollywood movies, 1989, Field of Dreams, about a farmer who converted uh, his field to baseball field, and the players came. Um, and so, my advisor, Dr. Mollendorf um, often used it, <laughs> and so it kind of uh, got imprinted at me, uh, on me. So uh, I kind of live by that uh, expression. I try to build things, and hopefully good things come. Um, and since we are talking about University at Buffalo, I graduated there in 2002 uh, with a PhD in mechanical engineering. Um, another, like, uh, accent of that movie is the title, Field of Dreams. Um, and so Greta is 16 years old. Uh, my older son is 16 years old. And so then we question ourselves, are we leaving them with the field of dreams? Or uh, what can we do to toward that? So to have a brighter and better future for them. So that's kind of a, another reference from that movie. Here's another uh, uh, educational background slide. 
Uh, so I graduated in 95 uh, with a degree in thermal physics and engineering from St. Petersburg uh, Polytechnic University. Um, uh, and the college is uh, physics and mechanics. We just celebrated 100 years or 100 year uh, anniversary two weeks ago. Um, and this is one of my physics professors here. He's still, you know, uh, he's about 70 years old and uh, singing there on stage. There is a video, but I didn't put it in. Um, <laughs> uh, Vadim Ivanov. So, but it was quite a pleasure seeing him after more than 25 years since then. Um, and also, uh, that was my home uh, for my 2011 Fulbright uh, project. Here's another uh, movie we are gonna talk about, uh, Big Bang Theory. And a Big Bang Theory brings three kind of uh, topics so I, I'm, I'm gonna discuss. First is, uh, as you know, in reality, or as we are imagining the reality, uh, Big Bang happened and it generated all of the hydrogen in the universe. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and then uh, hydrogen formed clouds, clouds formed stars, stars formed, no, stars burned uh, through hydrogen in the fusion process, and then they collapsed, exploded, created heavy elements. Um, this, you know, whatever remnants of stars came around sun, formed earth, and then we were born, and so we are children of stars. Uh, and uh, this is my TED talk opening. You know, I always wonder it. If I were to ever deliver a TED talk, how would I start about hydrogen? And, uh, and this is uh, this summer I was uh, talking to some children uh, visiting hydrogen station, and that came around to talk about uh, Big Bang. Second reference with the Big Bang is that uh, these people work at what university? Caltech, <laughs> yes, so they all work at Caltech, and if you look at the map of Los Angeles, so this is central Los Angeles, Caltech is right here in Pasadena, um, then we have University of California, Los Angeles, somewhere there, then another famous university is University of Southern California, and here is my home university, Cal uh, California State University, Los Angeles, uh, we have about 27,000 students, uh, and uh, it's a comprehensive university, uh, public university serving um, predominantly East Los Angeles area, but obviously we have students from all over place. Um, and the third reference, I don't know if for how many of you are watching this uh, series, um, so Sheldon is, uh, a uh, brilliant scientist, and at some point in the series, they had to award him a Nobel Prize, right? And, uh, you know, Caltech is famous for a number of um, Nobel Prize winners. And so I thought, like, what, you know, um, would be interesting about that. Um, so, <laughs> um, Thank you, Fulbright program. I'm really looking forward in a month to attend the real Nobel Prize ceremony as a guest of Fulbright program. But I thought that maybe I have done something in life that would deserve Ig Nobel Prize. And if you probably know, it's a, a satiric prize awarded annually since 91 to celebrate 10 unusual or trivial achievements in scientific research. And I thought maybe I can have an entry. All right, so what you see here on that picture is uh, Lego Mindstorms. It's kind of a robotic lab, uh, Lego version that I decided to stick in a fuel cell. It's a hydrogen fuel cell. There is a little tank uh, up front, right there. There is a little tank. This is the fuel cell and the power conditioning unit. And so that was, so let's watch a little video and listen. I heard. <laughs> I read. I read. I think. I'm one. 
Oh, we have lift off. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> I really love that the one skills so that you have a lift off. And so, so it's, it's, it's the first time ever we were running a, a Lego on uh, hydrogen. Please raise hands whoever played with Lego in their childhood. Right? Engineer, 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 engineer. <laughs> <laughs> at least in heart, at least in heart, right? And so I thought that one, uh, this uh, little vehicle would be worth of that Ig Nobel Prize for blending together Lego and hydrogen. So let's go next slide. So. Obviously, that was a too small of a vehicle for me, and I thought we will build uh, a bigger hydrogen vehicle. So please enter Hydrogen Super Eagle that we built for 2011 Shell Eco Competition. You see big blue tank, right? So that's hydrogen. And uh, let's see, uh, let's watch her running. And here she goes. Um, despite its size, I fit there comfortably. Uh, it's uh, being uh, filmed right now, so speaking of Hollywood, it's being filmed by Discovery Channel for their uh, Prophets of Science Fiction series uh, dedicated, to, uh, one of the series was dedicated to um, uh, Jules Verne and Captain Nemo predicting use of hydrogen in the future economy, and here she goes. And guess what? Ah. Let's see, before guess what, uh, let's do this one first. Okay, so this is a slide um, about the fuel cells and how the robust they are. So this vehicle was built for competition 2011, um, but I had a student and I asked him to revive the vehicle, and it worked, you know, and it worked in 2017 and 2018. Tiran Gokusian, and he did a system, a system study with the solar system we have, with the electrolyzer we have, and the fuel cell vehicle we have. So here he is racing. Um, and so if you have a solar conversion of about 10% or 20%, we have uh, two types of solar, uh, then you go for electrolysis, then you go for fuel cell vehicle, you don't get a lot of efficiency. But we can do a lot of efficiency or we can improve quite a bit with the solar, uh, so that, that's where we lose the most. Then uh, electrolysis, this is a kind of a small unit, so it's only 30%, we can go to 50. Um, and the vehicles, that's about right uh, efficiency for fuel cell vehicles. So we kind of, uh, I always wanted to do that study and with the real stuff we have at the university, and Tehran did a spectacular job. And right now, he's teaching my fuel cell course, so while I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> it's really, really good to train your students. Um, and uh, he will be using the hydrogen super eagle as a, as a case study in the course. So it's fun, it just works perfect. Um, and uh, I guess, guess what, that was uh, too small. Uh, we decided to build a bigger vehicle. Uh, and it actually my second bigger vehicle, the first was a Chevrolet Malibu that we converted uh, as a part of EcoCar 2 competition 2011-2014. And then in 2014-2018, um, we built this uh, police plug-in hybrid uh, Chevrolet Camaro. Again, it's a premier US competition of 16 teams only. We were the only team uh, uh, representing California, um, so technically it comes out like one team per three, four states. Um, so uh, <coughs> uh, very, uh, very demanding project. Uh, at some point, I had almost 80 students working in various parts of the vehicle. Uh, what we did very unique in this competition, we decided to build that as a police vehicle, kind of a referencing back to Los Angeles and fighting crime. So we decided to build a hybrid vehicle for police force, uh, law enforcement, and uh, it actually has a lot of benefits uh, for law enforcement. I just delivered it a few weeks ago here at Chalmers, uh, lecture just on eco car and how we designed there all this. It was another one hour lecture. But what I would like to highlight here is that we did a ton of outreach not only to uh, general public and high school students, 
but we also outreach to law enforcement. Here I'm giving a quiz on the top left corner after I gave them lecture on hybrid vehicles, giving Sheriff's Department a quiz. Um, here on the top we have uh, one of the top commanders uh, from uh, Los Angeles, from City of Los Angeles. Um, and next to him there is uh, Al Oppenheiser, who is the chief engineer for the Camaro program for General Motors. What I learned from this uh, commander was that he said, I have young officers and they love, ex you know, cool cars. And so I was really kind of uh, rewarded with his comment that our car would work for his, uh, his officers. And here on the bottom right, uh, I met uh, another officer and he said, you know, you should try all the gear on and try to get in and out of the car. And so <laughs> I did, we have a coupe, right? So Camaro coupe is really good, even if you have all that gear. Um, I don't have uh, the bulletproof vest, but it still it would be very comfortable with our car. But uh, there are some manufacturers who are trying to, to um, convert their regular cars into police cars, and I, I would think that would not work with all that police gear. That's, that's tough. And again, a little bit of uh, entertainment uh, Hollywood references. You, you can see Jay Leno right there uh, at one of the car shows, and so I gave him a lecture what hybrid cars are. <laughs> um, and what is interesting, just recently, uh, there was a, there is a YouTube video with, with Jay Leno trying out Koenigsen uh, hybrid car, uh, right? So, uh, and you know, Koenigsen is a Swedish uh, high performance uh, uh, vehicle manufacturer. So kind of, I think I'm, I'm gonna take credit for exciting him on hybrid cars. <laughs> All right, so uh, I built not only uh, I built not only uh, cars, I also built other things. Um, so here we with my trusted uh, te technician at the college, very talented guy, one of my former students, and then he became a technician at the college, uh, Blake Cortis. Um, and um, one, we was just changed one of the arrays because uh, we had very old and efficient array. I built the system in 2011 from donated. Those are self-donated, so those are sharps. And then uh, we installed brand new 20% efficient LG modules. Also, I participated uh, in um, campus uh, um, electrical vehicle charging infrastructure. The very first we installed was two chargers in 2011. Then we grew to 19 chargers, and this fall we went up with a new parking structure to 59 chargers, and uh, we got six uh, fast DC chargers, so it's uh, something I was very intimately involved with uh, to have those on campus. Very happy and uh, proud of that accomplishment for our campus. And here we go. Back to hydrogen, and so from now on we're gonna stay on hydrogen. Uh, so this is, a, this is an example of a research done at the uh, Institute of Transportation Studies at UC Davis. That's where you stole uh, Sonia from. <laughs> uh, so, it's a, so it's a very respected uh, university um, and uh, home to very talented researchers. So that's what they predicted for 2050, 2050 uh, sales so, uh, of uh, clean vehicles. And so as we can see uh, here, the blues are electric vehicles and pinks are hydrogen fuel cell vehicles. So for light duty vehicles, they, the, this uh, research group predicts that it would be about 35% of light duty vehicles, passenger cars on hydrogen. Um, then uh, for um, light duty trucks, it uh, goes to 50%, 80% for long haul trucks. Short haul trucks, uh, again, are doing really good at 45, 50%. So as you can see from this, it's gonna be like a relatively fair competition between electric vehicles and hydrogen, and so, we need to work toward the uh, hydrogen economy. So how that might look like um, in 2050 
Uh, this is uh, uh, some graphics uh, we developed with my um, uh, team of students uh, that worked on a project for a hydrogen student design competition uh, in 2018. And so one of the slides we developed was the um, hydrogen economy vision. And it was, uh, what we are imagining about hydrogen in the future, we are going to produce sufficient amount of uh, renewable energy. It could be solar and wind. Uh, excess energy that we generate will be converted to hydrogen for electrolysis and to storage. Then it could be utilized uh, for uh, residential, industrial, and commercial applications. And also it could be realized in the transportation sector. So here is the uh, trucks delivering whatever the trucks usually deliver, passenger cars. And we also were thinking about other uses, and uh, since then it actually has picked up the interest in that area. Um, we have distribution, we have port operation, uh, railway operations, forklifts is the success story of hydrogen, as a matter of fact, um, and also airports, but it's kind of a whole different discussion. Um, so where I come in, I come in here in uh, hydrogen uh, dispensing for vehicles or uh, heavy duty vehicles or buses. So we, we've dispensed everyone, we've tried everyone. So before I go to my hydrogen station, I just want to give a brief uh, overview of California hydrogen infrastructure and uh, Bill Elric is going to talk more in greater detail about it. So right now we have about 40 hydrogen stations in California. Um, a number of them opened up just recently. So this is the Southern California. So here is again uh, kind of a, like a Los Angeles area. Uh, here is uh, along the shore. So that's kind of a Southern group. And then we have a group of stations in Northern California. The way we try to build hydrogen stations, we try to build them with a model called cluster when the several stations are nearby. If a one station goes out of service, then the other uh, stations can pick up the slack. Uh, and the connectors are just like a, a stations in between, so that when, the stu when uh, drivers need uh, hydrogen, they can stop by on a long haul. And here's the example, here you go, connector type station. And we have a few connectors uh, stations going to San Francisco. So what we have here, and I would like to actually reflect more on what uh, Sonia said today about the role of California. So you see uh, Japan recently overtaking California with hydrogen, 100 uh, hydrogen stations. Germany, 75 and going. Korea is coming up with 30 and going more. So in the California used to be a leader in the world in hydrogen stations, and now you know, we just have 40. Um, but don't despair. California is very important if you remember Back then, uh, it was the state that introduced catalytic converters and made everyone use catalytic converters. Have you ever been behind a car that doesn't have one? Right, it's a, it's a guzzler. So, uh, so that leadership is important, and the same leadership happened uh, with California. California said, we are going to move forward, and we're going to try to force manufacturers to produce fuel cell vehicles. Uh, this is... Um, kind of a chicken and egg problem, who's going to build hydrogen stations? So state of California said, we are going to be building hydrogen stations. We are going to have that experience, and you manufacturers build uh, hydrogen cars. And for a uh, vehicle manufacturer, it's not easy to build a new vehicle. You know, I, I just did a conversion uh, uh, eco car, right? So it was a conversion from a regular car into a plug-in hybrid. And over four years, it was almost $900,000. And I didn't pay full salaries to students. We just had a few stipends. Uh, for, a, for a vehicle manufacturer to commit to producing a new, brand new car, it's uh, hundreds of people involved. And each car comes out like a Rolls Royce, right? A million dollars per car. So that's a realization. So when the state makes uh, manufacturers and manufacturers go along, it's a big, big change for the entire world. And that's now the results of California leadership. So that's kind of what I wanted to uh, echo what Sony was saying today already. So uh, I'd like to introduce the major types of uh, hydrogen uh, stations before going again to mine. Um, 
we have uh, the way hydrogen can be distributed is uh, a variety of ways. Uh, unlike a gasoline that it's just you deliver with the tank uh, liquid uh, gasoline and put it in the tank. Um, for hydrogen, there are various models and uh, opportunities. So we can deliver liquid hydrogen, or we can deliver a compressed hydrogen in a trailer. Um, we can produce uh, hydrogen um, on-site fuel reforming. I don't really like that method because it has a lot of challenges. Uh, there is a, um, that's uh, my station. We produce uh, uh, hydrogen on-site from electrolysis. You can have a um, uh, hydrogen pipeline, very interesting uh, example in California and very interesting example in Sweden. Uh, you can have a combined, combined usually would be something delivery pl plus electrolysis. And today we were talking about circular economy. The, we had a Orange County sanitation district creating a very complex system with a high temperature fuel cell, molten carbonate fuel cell with internal reforming and bypassing some of the hydrogen not utilizing. And they were um, using biogas as a fuel. So it's a very complex system, but it worked and produced hydrogen and there was a hydrogen station like that. Um, the picture here is another um, issue for hydrogen stations. Um, as we are building uh, or we developing this infrastructure with uh, hydrogen, um, we figured out that uh, you need a service, you need a person uh, attending that hydrogen station. And so co-locating existing gasoline stations with hydrogen is a good solution because you'll have already attendant someone who can assist drivers, for example, right? And so there are multiple stations that going up uh, in California, they go as uh, same location, uh, both hydrogen and gasoline. What I really like about this particular solution is when you talk about urban environment, how, where you stick all the your hydrogen equipment, right? So that was pretty interesting solution to put it on the rooftop above the fueling island. And uh, right there, this one is hydrogen. Hydrogen dispenser. All right, so here's the next slide. Um, and on, on this slide, I'm, I'm, I'm showing you, uh, this is a liquid hydrogen delivery, and you can deliver 4,500 kilograms of hydrogen as a liquid. There is a price to pay, about 30% of energy will be taken by uh, conversion to liquid hydrogen. Or you can deliver uh, hydrogen in a, a compressed form in a tank, or you can even drop off the trailer um, and use it for fueling um, uh, hydrogen cars or whatever hydrogen application you might have. Um, I probably wouldn't have put this slide for today's presentation, but it has any, some caveat. Anyone can see the caveat? Both of them are Volvo trucks. <laughs> so I thought that would be a good Swedish kind of a reference and a hint to Volvo to build fuel cell trucks. <laughs> All right. And so this is uh, uh, my hydrogen station. So I'm going to run an uh, introductory video. Um, it's about three minutes. That video was created by my very talented high school student who was uh, taking internship um, a couple years ago. And so I asked her to create that video because she was very talented. I thought she would do a good job. Let's see. Amy Tem. Hello, and welcome to the Cal State LA Hydrogen Station. Opened in 2014, this station is the first station in the world to provide hydrogen to retail customers. A brainchild of Dr. James Ataro, this station was built to educate and encourage new strategies for alternative power sources. Thanks to the donors at California Air Resources Board and other donors, the hydrogen station is at an advantageous location close to downtown Los Angeles on the 710 and 10 highways. At the Cal State LA hydrogen station, we produce our own hydrogen. The process of creating hydrogen starts with city water, which is demineralized and sent to the electrolyzer. At the electrolyzer, the purified water mixes with an electrolyte. 
Then electricity is run through the solution to separate hydrogen and oxygen from H2O. The hydrogen is kept and stored for fueling and the oxygen is released into the atmosphere. The hydrogen is then sent to a low pressure compressor, which increases the pressure of the hydrogen from the initial pressure of 150 psi, meaning pounds per square inch, to 6,200 psi. For reference, the pressure in a car tire is around 32 psi. For conversions, one bar is equal to 14.5 psi, which is equal to 0.1 megapascals. After hydrogen is compressed, it is sent to the storage tanks to be stored for later use. There are three storage tanks which hold 20 kilograms in each tank. So in total, 60 kilograms of hydrogen can be stored on site. Once these tanks are full, the electrolyzer shuts off and waits for a fueling event. A typical hydrogen vehicle stores hydrogen at 10,000 psi, which is a higher pressure than the hydrogen in the storage tanks. Hydrogen at higher pressures allows consumers to fuel more in their tank. Therefore, a second set of compressors are required, which are called hydropacks, which increase hydrogen pressure from 6,200 psi to roughly 10,000 psi. After the hydrogen gas is compressed, it heats up, so hydrogen goes through a chiller in order to cool down, which also allows the hydrogen to be fueled at a faster rate without overheating the car tanks. A hydrogen dispenser is designed to be similar to CNG fueling and easier for the consumers. The dispenser nozzle is equipped with infrared technology, which communicates information such as the vehicle tank temperatures and pressures which allow the system to monitor a prime fueling rate or stop fueling if there are any problems. Other precautions such as leak sensors, flame detectors, and leak tests are taken during fueling, making fueling completely safe. We hope that after this virtual tour of the station, you have learned a little more about the Cal State LA Hydrogen Station and that we will see you soon. If you'd like to learn more about the station, please visit our website. So the video is available online, it's on YouTube, and if you would like to find it, just type Cal State LA Hydrogen Station. So just to recoup, uh, what we have here is a uh, station was built actually even in 2011, but after fixing stuff, we grand opened uh, in 2014. We can pr our electrolyzer can produce 60 kilograms a day from renewable electricity. Uh, the tanks on the left are uh, storage tanks, and they hold 60 kilograms. Um, of hydrogen at about 350 to 400 bar. And then we go from, during fueling, we can go with the blue compressors right there to about 700 bar. Um, and uh, with three to four kilograms uh, per tank on a fuel cell vehicle, we can fuel about 15 to 20 cars per day. And on one kilogram, it would be normal to drive uh, 100, mi uh, 100 kilometers or even more. So the hydrogen station is equipped with the state-of-the-art control system. We have multiple screens like that. Um, so the, all of the equipment is obviously in the system, uh, and we can monitor a variety of uh, uh, events and variety of processes that are taking place. Um, if things don't want to work well, then we get uh, red light warnings that we fix. So all of that data gets stored in uh, Microsoft uh, SQL database. Typically, we generate uh, quarterly reports that we submitted to National Renewable Energy Laboratory and California Air Resources Board on the station performance, how compressors work, how many fueling events, how much hydrogen we have in the storage, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, energy consumption. However, if we are doing any particular studies, we can do we can go into the database and pull out whatever data we would need um, for our station. Uh, in the video, you probably heard there was an interesting phrase, the first station to re offer retail of hydrogen. Um, retail of hydrogen is kind of an important issue uh, maybe five years ago because uh, 
uh, all the fuelings were happening on per, kilo, uh, per, per event base. So once car pulls in and you uh, start fueling, $60. Um, no matter how much hydrogen you would get. So uh, that was very important, but uh, the quality of the meters was not as good. Uh, our station was the first one to go through, through this uh, um, weights and measures approval of the dispenser. And so as you can see at uh, one of the fuelings uh, from 350 bar side, uh, we were just one gram off. It was really good. So overall, you know, different uh, fueling events in the course of two days uh, came out pretty good, and we were uh, 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 awarded a seal of sale by kilogram or whatever the grammage would be uh, when we sell hydrogen within 5% accuracy. So that's the seal of approval, and we were the first in the world to accomplish that. So here I'm going to show you a little video. So uh, this is the one of the screens you sh saw in the video as well. And I'm kind of walk you through the fueling process like we have it in life. I re pre-recorded it uh, right there. So I pre-recorded it uh, in my remote login mode. So hydrogen stations can be controlled in I gotta share the screen, I guess. Okay. Hold on. Yes. Do that. <laughs> Hold on. Let me zoom in a little. So the video is not working at all. So the video shows. Okay, it's working. So be patient, right? All right, here we go. <laughs> so, so here we have a live uh, fueling event um, that I'm recording. Um, so we start fueling with uh, two puffs of hydrogen. So one puff and a second puff. And so one establishes the pressure and establishes the volume of the tank. So at this point, we know how much hydrogen is in the tank in the vehicle. Um, and then right here you can see that, so those are pressure things, right? And right here we can uh, see a little flat line. Flat line is to establish that there is no leak of hydrogen in the connection that we made, all right? So that's called leak check. After that, we are ready to fuel and we establish a ramp rate. Ramp rate is how fast we are building up pressure inside of the tank. So the pressure goes up in a certain uh, in a certain corridor and so the upper and lower limits of that corridor are established by these two lines and then um, we are moving inside of that corridor quite well um, another uh, screen here is uh, related so this one is a pressure side this one is the temperature side in order to fuel uh, vehicles faster we need to pre-cool hydrogen. So our hydrogen station is considered minus 20 degrees. It's called T20 station. Um, this is the pink line is an instant temperature and it could jump up and down. But at about 30 seconds, we are gonna start calculating so-called uh, mass average temperature. Mass average temperature, it's uh, taking account the amount of the flow times the temperature, right? And so that establishes uh, uh, average temperature flowing in. So instant temperatures can jump in and out. That's not important as long as we are delivering the mass uh, 
All right, so that's, we are moving forward. So I kind of, uh, let's go right somewhere there. So at this point, we have another leak check. Um, so right there at this point, you can see another, there was a stoppage at about 3,000 PSI between the first point and here. We again stopped, paused for a few seconds, made sure there is no leak that has developed. And uh, the temperature jumped a little bit because there was no flow, but the average stays the same. And about now we are going to abort uh, because we are going to achieve the pressure we were looking for. Uh, just a few more seconds. Here we go. So um, at this point, which you see on the screen, we aborted the fueling. And here's some other screens I was clicking. Um, so that's our electrolyzer, for example, you can see. Here is another, like a technical screen, but uh, right there on the top it says uh, our fuel is complete. Right there it will says uh, vehicle fuel stop. And here's another screen and one more screen. So that's kind of a, um, a lot of technical screens when you work with and try to fuel. Um, and as you can see, you can see the status. Here's one of the storage tanks. That's the bank two, bank three is almost full. So there are about 30 kilograms of hydrogen at the station. So that's kind of a um, thing I was going to share with you. Let's go back and hopefully things work. <laughs> uh, some magic. So we're back into the presentation. All right, so I also asked one of the students, uh, and it was Amy, uh, Amy Tam, the high school student, to create a map of failures. So one of the things we are very big in hydrogen uh, station business is safety and maintenance and operations, right? Because we wanna provide our uh, drivers with reliable um, fueling experience, and if things don't work, and they often don't work, uh, it's not a good experience for the drivers in the hydrogen world. Uh, so um, uh, we had multiple failures by years. So uh, we are going to update that graphics with more data from 18 and 19. But uh, as when we opened the station, there was a lot of uh, leaks from uh, various valves in the system. Then in 2015, we had a lot of failures in the dispenser. Uh, the valves got worn out from working in and out, and so the seal started leaking, and uh, that's the highest pressure in the system. So uh, right here, well, this is the tanks, this is the compressors, this is the chiller, uh, and that's the dispenser, right? So um, chiller had m number of failures in 2016. What happened? It worked for two years. But then uh, the pump started failing. We actually cranked up our chiller and it started working a little bit harder. And the cooling pump that was uh, pumping the uh, coolant uh, started to fail and we put another one and we put another one until we bought a German-made pump. <laughs> and it works. <laughs> uh, so uh, this was interesting and you can see 2017 shows like a significant reduction in failures because Whatever was failing, we kind of caught up, but still things fail time to time. It's very interesting experience fixing it, um, and I will introduce a person a little bit later who, who does that. Um, and as a matter of fact, that person is right here. Uh, where is my, oh, right there. Michael Dre is our uh, hydrogen station operations manager, uh, and he makes that hydrogen station work. So one of the things besides technical studies, how hydrogen station operates and what happens to that, we do a ton of outreach. Here are some records. And we actually do more. We're just not always good at keeping the numbers. But those are really the numbers we recorded. And so sometimes uh, we had in one quarter more than 1,000 people come and visit. What I take personal credit for is a uh, you know, one of the people involved in the construction of hydrogen station is this passageway where we can bring large groups of people and educate them how hydrogen station works. So that was uh, one of the professional meetings that came over. 
this, this summer I took this picture with these uh, students, and the reason I'm showing it because it was so cute with the lab Kerms codes. They came, you know, like to study about hydrogen, so I loved it. Um, and here is uh, Jamie Cromwell. He, uh, it's a famous U.S. actor again, entertainment, entertainment reference. And here's the first man who reached warp drive. If you guys watch the Star Trek, <laughs> and so I thought it would be fun um, to show you. Um, and so. Continuing with the theme, I started, uh, if you build it, uh, he will come. Um, we build hydrogen station and we actually now have a shared mobility program um, with the 12 vehicles. We kind of grew it over and we just started in November 2018, so it's a brand new program and I have an introductory video for you. The WaveCar is one of Cal State LA's newest sustainability programs that was introduced in spring 2019. With this program, faculty, staff, and students 21 years and older will be able to book a zero emission vehicle for two hours at no cost. Any additional time is $5.99 per hour. There will be designated parking spots for them throughout campus to pick up and return after each booking. Now let me take you through the steps in order to sign up and start your trip with WaveCar. First, download the WaveCar app through the App Store and fill out your information to create your account. Once that is complete, you will come to a screen showing you a map of the available WaveCars. Choose the nearest vehicle to you and hit book. After you book the car, you have 15 minutes to reach it before the booking time's out. In order to unlock the car, simply hit unlock on the screen in the app and start the car by pushing your foot down on the brake and pressing the power button. Once you have returned the car to one of the designated parking spaces, make sure the key is in the sensor and turn off the car. After, verify your location when returning the car and hit finish and lock on the app. For more information on the sustainability of WaveCar, here is Dr. Blechman. Hello, my name is David Blechman, I'm a professor of technology at Cal State LA, and I would like to talk about hydrogen fuel transportation and the exciting shared mobility WaveCar program. Hydrogen fuel is a sustainable fuel. It can be produced from sunshine or from wind. The electricity is combined with water and then water is split to produce hydrogen and oxygen. Then we use this clean hydrogen to fuel the cars. Hydrogen vehicles are going to be a very important component of future mobility. Hydrogen vehicles excel at quick refueling and long distance driving. So they will have a very major role in introducing new transportation. We are very excited to host the WAVE car program and utilize shared mobility vehicles uh, utilizing hydrogen. Also in the future, we are hoping to bring in shuttle buses that utilize hydrogen, potentially forklifts and other technologies so to make our campus more sustainable and lead the way for other CSU campuses. All right. And so this program was very successful and we were awarded um, a best practice o uh, award in uh, transport transportation, sustainable transportation by California Higher Education uh, Conference. Uh, I would like to introduce very important people here. On the left is the Matteo Genovese. He's a PhD researcher from University of Calabria. And we would like to thank the uh, government of uh, Italy and the uh, European government for sponsoring him. Um, then Carmen Gachupin is a director of parking and transportation, and she was uh, instrumental in all of our transportation programs, including she's uh, my counterpart uh, in uh, electrical vehicle infrastructure, myself, and again, Michael Gray, operations manager uh, that uh, fearlessly fixing our hydrogen station. <laughs> Um, <coughs> with, uh, with the cars, we, uh, we shared mobility. We're still looking for a partner to help us analyze big data that we generate <laughs> uh, with our shared mobility on campus. And you can see in spring, we actually have more rides than we had this fall. And the reason is that we finally opened the new parking uh, structure before we utilized the remote parking. And so people, when they were on campus, the, the instead of going to remote and drive their cars for their daily needs, uh, they were able to utilize it now that we have parking. They don't have to um, 
you know, park far away and use some other vehicles. But it's still a very popular program, and we get uh, a lot of compliments for that uh, option for our students. Um, also, um, when you have cars, and again, if you build it, they will come. So now we have these cars, we can stage very interesting experiments um, with hydrogen vehicles. So uh, in one day we were fueling so many cars in so-called uh, kind of back-to-back um, -back fueling. Uh, um, and so here data is for cooling system performance. We recently updated our cooling system from one chiller to two chillers. And so with the two chillers, we really have a steady performance. Uh, another student from Italy, Francesco Pirano, uh, he studied that he modeled uh, the dual system cooling. But as you can see, we are in the corridor. I was explaining there was a cooling corridor as well between 17.5 and 26 degrees, uh, minus 26 degrees Celsius. And all of the fuelings, so now we have this bunch of cars. We can make them all empty at some point bring them in and do some fun, uh, you know, fun experiments. And Matteo is working on another paper that would be sharing data we collected in these experiments. Okay. Next. Okay, here we go. And again, uh, once we have, uh, we had a whole bunch of fuel cell vehicles, I really, really, uh, push to have this project done. Uh, uh, for many years I've had on my mind, can you, can you collect water from fuel cell vehicles? So, uh, uh, and also uh, I was reading th uh, proposals that would have fuel cell vehicles generate electricity during disasters. And I said, well, if we have a disaster making electricity, can we make some water? So we experimented and played with that and we were not very successful. So on the very left, oh, I can't find that laser, but anyway, on the very left top, you can see a uh, makeshift device and that would imitate disaster. Can you like just put copper pipes and generate any water? Yeah, it was dripping, but very little. Uh, then on the bottom picture, we installed with a fan and a box and we were getting about one liter of hydrogen uh, per kilogram of hydrogen. So Supposedly, we are supposed to generate nine liters of, uh, of water from one kilogram of hydrogen and we were just getting one. And so, so we scrambled uh, um, that work in terms of we can't make a makeshift device to work. <laughs> but we can make a more professional engineer de device right there um, that we can mount on the back of the car. And so what the students did, we have an intercooler with a fan uh, and so that's where the stream would be cooled uh, and then it will be collected in this um, uh, vessel right there. So um, that's what we, did. we assembled and what we noticed when the stream would go um, through the intercooler, it will create a lot of droplets in the stream but we were not condensing them. So we actually looked at this problem and we devised uh, it's a, it's, a, it's a separation, water droplet separation in the stream is a common engineering problem. And these students did a, like a cyclonic flow with the reverse. And after that, we started getting far more water. And then we uh, very nicely packaged that as a final product. Uh, and you even can see, oh, okay. <laughs> little scared. And uh, we can even, um, see the license plate. All right, so uh, next what we did, we did experiments. Uh, that is driving at about 28 degrees Celsius. We can get 1.4 liters. With the 20 degrees Celsius, we get uh, two liters. And at about 10 degrees Celsius, you will get about three liters of water. So the, the challenge and the secret was, and now, you know, if you look at the science, um, when you run a uh, fuel cell with hydrogen and air, oxygen gets consumed, but then you have nine kilograms of water that is dissolved in at least 32 kilograms of nitrogen. Plus we actually usually bypass some of the air, so that might be even in 40 kilograms. So that's what made that difficult, but I was really happy with that result. Um, so I have uh, 10 minutes, perfect. 
Uh, I also want to talk about another aspect that we deal with uh, with the hydrogen stations is safety. And uh, this summer we had two accidents that happened in the hydrogen um, world. Uh, one was a fueling facility at Air Products. That's the facility where they were fueling or uh, pumping hydrogen into the trailers. Um, and so the, some fire and explosion happened there. And then there was a one hydrogen station um, in Norway near Oslo that had explosion. And so that's the picture down the bottom of the fire and explosion before that at that uh, Norwegian hydrogen station. So this is a very devastating kind of uh, experiences for industry and we would like to avoid them and build knowledge about that. So here on the, la on the right, you I have a snapshot, of a just took it yesterday, uh, of the hydrogen station availability. And you can see some of them are red. So it means that the drivers cannot get hydrogen there. And um, one of the big reasons is that that facility of air products is not in service, still not in service. Um, and so the uh, hydrogen now is being uh, shuttle between Southern California to Northern California. So some Southern California stations are uh, um, starving a little bit. And so, so the deliveries became much more difficult uh, because of that accident. So we would like to avoid that. And so I have one more, I think it's a last video for you. Uh, as I said, we do built with the students this little device when you mix in your uh, uh, flammable gas, oxidizer, and you can explode it. And so prior to that, we did a uh, little experiments. So it doesn't look like this, but they were testing their ignition system for that device. Three, two, one. There we go. And it burned. It was really nice. Uh, Leo, do you want to say something? <laughs> yeah. Success. <laughs> and I always love this the student comments, little comments behind. Uh, so another horizontal. Then we are trying one vertical. All right. And now one vertical sealed off. So now it's going to be with water. So you can see there is a little, little, little amount of gas on the top. And so what? What you learn in that little video is that when, uh, when you have a mixture of uh, flammable gas and uh, oxidizer and you, and you just fire it, the flame will propagate and everything will be fine uh, while it's open. But if you're enclose, uh, that will build a shock wave and it will create an explosion. So that's the reason we try to build hydrogen stations open so we don't accumulate any hydrogen and so that will be um, uh, safe environment. Um, and um, there is a tendency right now to build hydrogen stations in containers and deliver. So you want to be careful there is a, a, a ample ventilation. So <laughs> I was working on that list of big things for my colleagues at Cal State LA with whom I work and collaborated over the years. On the top, I would like to highlight two people, Virgil Simon and Keith Muyang, who was a dean, and uh, they both trusted me with things to build on campus. Um, the professional list will go on pages and pages, so I decided uh, to spare you from that, but I would like to thank everyone I have ever worked with on those projects. Uh, and the last segment uh, of my presentation is uh, to talk about what I'm going to do here and I'm trying to do here. Um, so the goal is to look at the hydrogen network uh, uh, in Scandinavia uh, and learn as much as possible about how they work, what are the issues, what I can do to help. And also I'm looking for a sister hydrogen station you know, across the ocean between the United States, uh, perhaps educational uh, institution or some other uh, leaders in the hydrogen industry. Uh, so that would be great. Um, I already visited a hydrogen station here in Gothenburg. Currently, it uh, was built by a Finnish company, Wykoski. Uh, they uh, 
are not interested in operating this hydrogen at the, uh, and uh, there is a transfer of ownership. So we are really hoping it will be open soon. Uh, but what is interesting, the hydrogen station here uh, uh, in Gothenburg is uh, co-located on the parking lot that belongs to a company called PowerCell. And PowerCell is a very important player in the fuel cell world. They are producing uh, vehicle uh, quality, uh, ready to go into the vehicles, fuel cells. Um, and so uh, I'm hoping to see those in uh, automotive world very soon. Uh, this is a, a now independent spin-off from Volvo fuel cell efforts. And there was there is another hydrogen station that I visited, and I really enjoyed that visit with Matt Salunberg. Uh, he's a sustainability business manager for Sandvik. Um, and so he saw a great opportunity here. Um, so this is kind of a panoramic shot. If you can see, there are pipes going here. And uh, one of those pipes carries hydrogen. That hydrogen is renewably generated uh, by electrolysis from wind power and is used in uh, uh, metal processing at the factory. But the, um, the same time, they piped off a little bit just to go into their hydrogen station. And so that's the model that I already mentioned with the hydrogen pipelines. Industry uses hydrogen quite often, and so there, there are those opportunities to build hydrogen stations like that. Uh, here is a, a few more hydrogen stations uh, here in uh, Norway uh, and Denmark. There are a couple more to visit uh, in the Sweden as well. And I guess that's uh, my presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, David, yeah, for you. sharing your knowledge and for, for spreading the word for um, hydrogen. Um, we have a um, little plan here for um, the next speaker. So he has sent you the e his slides. He did? Yes, so it's on your computer. <laughs> if right. you're possible to get them up, it would be great. And he will be ready. Uh, I have, have email contact with him. So um, just maybe... Um, some stretching uh, arms up or, or legs in front or, or doing some, uh, some stuff. And we will have the last speaker uh, as, uh, yeah, in uh, like a five, well, one minute maybe. And don't forget that we are then having a reception with drinks and food outside after <coughs> the question and, and answer session that we have. I, I don't think I see it. So can't you find the um, oh, slides? Um, nope. Do you have it? It's from, yeah, I got it from oh, my computer. It here it is. Yeah. So we save all the questions. So please, uh, have you made notes um, of all everything you want to ask David? So we save for the questions to be um, answered by both Bill and David at the same time. And I'm looking at the technical stuff we have upstairs. Can you see if Bill is online and ready from your perspective there? I'm good. You're good. Is Bill good? Is there a sound? Or I have to go get sound? Uh -huh. <laughs> I see a, I see some face there. <laughs> yeah, our technical staff showed up in our computer here. So, so, so we are waiting for Bill to call in. Um, he said in an email to me that uh, he will be ready and that uh, he is ready. Thank 
So he waited, he waits for, for us to, to accept that, that, that he is uh, okay. trusted, trusted in here. In here. Ah. Yeah, yeah. Ad -ad -ad All right, Bill. Okay. So she's so in. And, uh, and the slide. I'm going to download one more. And Just uh, testing, Bill, can you hear us? If you can hear us, Bill, you can uh, start by uh, telling the time in the US and the weather. How are you? Early morning. How about now? Can you hear me? Yes. yes. We can. Ah, there we go. Here we go. Here we go. Welcome. Welcome. So, do you want us to, to take in charge of the slide? Uh, so now we have online uh, our last speaker for today. We are really happy and proud to announce that we have the final presentation uh, directly from California. It's the director of California Fuel Cell Partnership, Bill Elric, and he will share his views on hydrogen development from a California perspective. So. The floor is sure, and uh, David will be here helping you out with the slides. Great, Thanks, and the, thank you so much for having me. The slides are up on your end. Yeah. Oh. Okay, good. I can barely hear you, David. I can hear everyone else. Thanks again for having me. Uh, today, I was listening on the YouTube version, so I realized I was running a little behind because of the delay there. So, I, if you want to go ahead and advance to the overview slide, I want to talk real briefly today with you about what we're doing in California, uh, the group I work with, the California Fuel Cell Partnership, and where we are in the market, and, and where we're going next as well as some of the keys to our success because now that this is very global activity, uh, love sharing and love hearing what other people are doing so we can get to this, uh, this uh, zero emission vehicle world we all envision. So next, here in California, early on the state saw pollution as a very big issue and more recently greenhouse gas and climate change so we've enacted some very strict regulations around those issues. The most important was the zero emission vehicle regulation, which essentially required, and I believe David mentioned this, required the automakers to sell zero emission vehicles here in California. And then that rule is now followed by a number of other states around the country. We understood batteries back there in the 90s pretty well. Uh, but we saw this thing in fuel cells, and at the time, they were really coming out of space missions. But we thought there was something here, and we were saw, thought they were something very necessary to get to where we needed to be. And what, what we realized was we needed a lot of work to work on the fuel cell side. Uh, could it actually work and, and help us achieve our environmental goals? Next slide. So I think Dave mentioned many of, much of this on fuel cells and hydrogen. Uh, just to confirm, if not, we'll come back to it, the hydrogen and fuel cells uh, slide there. You know, hydrogen's an energy carrier like electricity and it creates a lot of opportunities for us. So we'll go to the next slide on the California Fuel Cell Partnership. We were created in 1999, 20 years ago, as a public-private collaboration 
to work on that challenge of building up the technology and solving our pollution issues. We have uh, members that come from government, from industry, from academics like Cal State LA, and we work jointly together to achieve that goal of fuel cell vehicle and hydrogen commercialization. Next slide. You should see an image of our 50 or so current members. Uh, we are an association that is not driven by increasing our size, rather having the right players around the table so that we can advance the market with all the different aspects we need of commercialization. You'll see in the middle uh, Cal State LA's logo, uh, and, and they've been a really active member, and I'll, I'll point out some of the things we do, and they're so active in so many of these areas. I might, and have, we, I might be oh, missing yeah? that slide, Bill. We have a, a progress in California market launch slide. Which one would you like us to go? Let's see. If you can go to the image called uh, the, the logo page, which should be about the fifth page. Right there. All right. And then advance one more, and we should be advancing the market. Uh, station operational status system. Oh, goodness. Um, oh, yeah, you're way advanced of me. If you can go back about four. Okay. Uh, so that's a partnership for the years? Okay, perfect. Perfect. Well, actually, go back one more, please. And it should be advancing the market in multiple ways. Oh, here's the members. Here's the call state LA. Got it. All right. Sorry about that. That's okay. That's okay. <laughs> um, one more past the logos. And it should say CAFCP advancing the market in multiple ways. Yes, we are there. <clears throat> Perfect. So what we do with this collection of members, each brings a different expertise into the group. And we use this in many different ways. We work on planning and roadmaps, you know, setting the sites of, of identifying where we want to go and making progress towards that. We do quite a bit of outreach, um, not so much billboards or advertisements, but really educating the key stakeholders who will help advance the market with us together. So that might be our legislature, our envi environmental groups. Uh, or, or even safety and permitting officials as we open new stations and they use the codes and standards that are developed. Uh, we have many members that provide different data and informational needs to us to advance this. And we do work in light duty and heavy duty operations. So we are only focused on the mobility side of hydrogen and fuel cells, uh, but we have an increasingly put heavy duty on our radar as that starts to develop. And then station implementation. And I, I really want to highlight with David uh, providing me the opportunity to share with you, Cal State LA really represents the membership in so many ways that, that they are part of these analysis and data gathering. They do the outreach with their station, and I'm sure you heard more about that. And, and really they uh, exemplify all the different pieces or many of the different pieces that that make the partnership strong and advance the situation. So the next slide uh, either will be the aero slide or maybe a hydrogen and fuel cell slide. Aero slide. Perfect. Um, and so through the years, at the beginning, 20 years ago, this technology really was in its infant stage. We were in the science fair aspect of creating the R&D aspects, the codes and standards, we moved on through the first demonstrations, and, and over the years, we got to where we are today, which is where the market started to work, um, or the technology started to work. So we started to look more, um, more recently in commercialization. So if you go to the next slide, one of the big challenges we had early on, and I did hear part of David speaking about this, is we realized, well, how do we actually start the commercial market? So we had all our members work together to create one of our first really important documents, which was answering the question, how do we start? So the 2012 California roadmap outlined how the first hundred stations would be necessary 
to start this progress. And, and those first stations would be in our, our metro areas like Los Angeles and the San Francisco Bay Area. But because these vehicles have fast fill and long range, we also needed to have connectors and destination stations across California. So these users could use these cars just like they do their, their conventional fuel vehicles. This gave us our opening vision on how to get going and, and was really an important piece to setting the stage. On the next slide, you'll see that our government has always been our key member set, meaning it takes everyone to do this. Uh, but what they did next with this plan in hand really galvanized our commercialization efforts. The governor Brown at the time, he did a few things. He created an executive order to put a million and a half vehicles on the road by, I think it was 2025. And that was a really important target for us to have. He also created an entire program built around zero emission vehicles. And then the legislature gave us funding to help us fund these first vehicles. So that way it was a, a, a combination of government and industry funds building the first stations together because we had never built retail stations. And this provided the confidence for industry to start investing into the market. And on the next page, you'll see an image from our, our uh, website. We track all the stations on our map. And this is an image of today. It is very close to how we thought it might look back in 2012. This is the San Francisco Bay Area. And we show the stations where they are. The green ones are the ones already open. The yellow ones are in the process of developing. And we track progress this way because customers need to know where the stations are and it's a very exciting time for us. If you go to the next uh, slide, you'll see one of the things we found where battery vehicles have a range anxiety, we have station anxiety. If you're starting to run low on fuel, you need to know if you're going north or south to the next, or the next station to get your fuel. So we collect data from all of the stations and put it onto our what we call SOS system or station operational status system. It gives near real time status on is the station open, how much fuel it has and, and a little bit more details. And we're starting to put mapping features and others into this. That data is sent to our servers directly from the stations and then fed back to our website and to a mobile app we have. And what's really exciting is one of the early stations that have been developing and in so much use, but Cal State LA is any day and I've been traveling, so it's possible it happened this week, but coming onto the SAW system as well. So if you hit the slide one more time, I think you'll see an image of what the, uh, it looks like on the phone app. One more slide forward. And you'll see images of the reality today. The, the network is working. We have real customers out here buying and leasing the vehicles and using them in their everyday lives. And we also have buses and trucks starting to come together. If you go one more, you'll see a, a table coming on. We have, this is almost a month old now, this data. I believe we have almost 8,000 vehicles on the road. We just opened our 42nd station this week. We have about 20 more in development and we have a number of buses on the road and more trucks coming. One more slide. And let me talk about the progress we're seeing. Again, the difference here in California versus other parts of the world is we're not going after fleets or businesses. We're going after customers, real folks like you and me and, and, and the cars that we drive every day. On the right is a chart of the utilization of these stations, the whole network. And as soon as we can open a station, drivers are coming and using it. So it's working. It's, it's really an amazing site. Um, and we're having to develop tools, like I mentioned, to make sure customers know where stations are and how to, how to get access to them. Uh, but so far, it's, it's, uh, it's been exciting. One more slide forward. And I wanna point out two things. The early stations took quite a while to develop because these were first of their kind, these first retail stations. Each year the states releases more money and the, everyone gets a little bit 
better at developing stations. The first ones would take four to five years to build. The stations coming online now are taking anywhere from 12 to 18 months. So that's really about the average time it takes a normal gas station to be developed. On the right side, you see data from the environmental benefits as well as the gas displacement. And what we see is even though other technologies have been in the market much longer, the investments in hydrogen are paying off and showing that they're going to have an even greater impact on our environmental issues than some of these other technologies. So it's great to see the success starting to show up that way. One more slide forward, and I just want to touch upon a few bits of forward momentum that we're seeing in this early stage of the market. The state is starting to look at policies different ways and instead of building the initial market, how do we ramp up the market? The Energy Commission, the group responsible on the government side for releasing funding, is set to release a new set of funding that instead of straightforward grants, is looking more, it's developed this new concept that will be more market focused to developing the network bigger and faster. We've also changed some of our regulations like the low carbon fuel standard to further incentivize station development. And on the industry side, we've heard multiple um, announcements of new hydrogen production facilities around the area in order to build the hydrogen supply up for the market. And automakers are starting to announce new vehicles like Hyundai with many models to come, Toyota just announcing their newest Mirai. And we're seeing the trajectory of these vehicles start to develop just like the hybrids and the plugins did before it. So we know we're on track. On the next slide, I wanted to point out, we also do heavy duty activities. And this is a graphic from the state showing some of the rules that they've put in place, uh, a new one that puts a zero emission mandate on transit buses, so that in the next 15 years, all of the transit buses in California will have to go to zero emission. They're doing the same with trucks, trains, and other heavy duty applications over the next few years. So we expect to see both batteries and fuel cell technologies rapidly deployed throughout the market. On the next slide, talking about this zero emission vehicle strategy we have, we're having good success, but right now it's only 2% of the market. And that's, that's after over a decade of battery vehicles in the market as well. So we've got to move from the left side of the image to the right side. And we know we need every application and technology we can get. So we're pushing both the batteries and the fuel cells rapidly to get there. And so what we realized was our challenge now isn't starting the market, that's worked. What we need to do, next slide please, is accelerate this market. We need to ramp this up, get through that dreaded valley of death and get to where zero emission technology is the norm. So we've spent the last couple of years looking at what a success looks like. What's the tipping point where fuel cell vehicles in California are the norm instead of the alternative? And last year we released a document, if you'll go one slide further, called the California Fuel Cell Re Revolution. And that was our image of success. And if you'll tap one more, you'll see that the, uh, the image of this in some most simplistic terms is we want to create a thousand hydrogen stations in California that could support up to a million vehicles by 2030. That kind of scale will bring costs down, will enable government to exit out of subsidies and industry to create profits and customers could have a vehicle and a fuel at a price and capability that they could replace their gasoline and diesel cars without a second thought. The next slide, and I think if you tap it twice, you'll see a comparison of the eight or 9,000 uh, stations in California of gasoline where the fuel is dispensed. A thousand was not a simple, easy number. We did a lot of analysis to find that well-placed, a thousand stations could give a similar coverage of the 8,000 stations for gasoline. What it means is instead of having two or three on a corner, we only have one and you might have to drive 10 minutes to the next station, but it puts us on track to have a really robust network that this works. 
And if you hit one more, you'll see we also looked at how heavy duty applications could complement the light duty because the heavy duty trucks drive up through the Central Valley in other cases and together light and duty infrastructure can really make a robust network for us. So on the next slide called strategies for reaching market success, the circle image, this is our strategy for getting there. There's three basic strategies, uh, the wedges on top. The first is developing the right policies that incentivize private investment to drive infrastructure development. That creates the scale we need so that in the second wedge, we can really work on the consumer adoption and the demand so that the zero emission option is as easy as the, as the conventional fuel. Once we see to start to see that success, we can then work on the third strategy is the light and heavy duty working together, as well as hydrogen as an energy carrier and how it complements electricity and, and renewable integration. So on the next slide, we have the next for California. We're working on those policies to get the private investment. We really need to bring the cost down, which will be created by scale. We need the renewable production pathety, pathways to be developed a long way so we get the true zero emission that we're seeking. And we're starting to look beyond California. This is happening in California as a leadership position, um, but we're starting to see demand in the states around us and in the Northeast uh, and around the world. So I'm really eager to share with you where we are just as we are around the US and around the world. And finally, we are looking at how the heavy duty sector comes along. On the next slide, simply put, we are different than the rest of the world in that we are not looking at fleets yet. We will start to see more of that naturally occur, but we are working on the, the consumer market. This is how we think we can help uh, add our, our piece to this puzzle globally. And what we need to do in essence is to create a value proposition for customers so they get the same uh, use and capability out of these vehicles at the same cost, and then it's attractive and they'll make that switch. So on the second to last slide, I have the lessons from California. I think I can boil it down to, we have seen our success has been built around three big things. They are leadership, especially from the state, they're having a vision and a plan that everyone gathers around, believes in and aims for, and then the commitments that everyone makes to see those through. Another big lesson is that this is a partnership, a collaboration with industry, government, academic, no one piece sector or piece of these, uh, this can be done by any one group. And so it's only by working together that we've had this success the education and outreach is always going because it is something to introduce something so groundbreaking and fundamentally of change and transformation. And, and there's many others here. I am looking at my time and I wouldn't be conscious of that. I think what I really see now is that global connectivity and, and how we all are working on pieces of this and it's exciting. And the more we can share and learn from each other, the faster this will go because scale is the most important thing to get to now. And so we're excited on what we're doing here. I, I'm really thankful for um, David uh, inviting me to be a part of this and your, your event today, or I think this evening at 7 a.m. here on our, our time. Um, and on the last slide, uh, if you'll, you'll go, I just wanna say thank you for the time, the opportunity. I don't know if you wanted questions or anything else. I'll happy to share these slides with everyone and my information is there. If anyone has uh, questions, happy to talk further on this. Thank you so much, Bill. We have a big applause for you here. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. And yes, we do have a question, a Q&A session uh, that will be some minutes before we have the refresh re refreshments in the reception. That's two different, <laughs> difficult and very close words. Um, I would like to start off with some questions myself first for both of you. So 
Myself, I'm working in the area in the energy systems analysis, taking into the systems perspective that so many different sectors are looking for hydrogen and also renewable electricity as their solution to become fossil free. Do you see any competition for your hydrogen or can you grab the hydrogen produced for the road-based sector? Have you any comments on the demand of hydrogen for fossil-free steel and for fossil-free chemical industry or something like that? What's about the competition? I start with David here. <laughs> yes. Uh, okay. I, I have an answer, but it, you might not like it. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, in reality, we can make hydrogen in two major ways. One is uh, electricity and uh, electrolysis, and you split water. And another way is uh, take uh, methane and put it through a fuel reforming process. And uh, in this really nice process, we are going to produce some CO2 and lots of hydrogen. Uh, and so, my vision is that for um, quite a few years we are not going to be able to have renewable hydrogen available in large quantities. What we are going to have is a transitional period that might take actually quite long. Um, uh, so you we built uh, it piece by piece so we will create hydrogen stations, we will create hydrogen vehicles and then uh, we also still need to build up our renewable uh, grid and meanwhile, that is happening. We are going to utilize uh, fuel reforming from natural gas to produce hydrogen. And as a matter of fact, it's not something new technology. It's a very well-developed technology. Uh, it was especially was uh, well-developed for space exploration. Um, hydrogen is powerful fuel and takes our rockets up space, right? So, so I don't have an easy answer. It's going to be quite a few years. Do you have any comments, uh, Bill, on uh, the yeah. competition? Absolutely, and, and I agree with David. The transition will be not as quick as we would like from today to the renewable side. And I think what I would add to that is currently in California, the hydrogen we're using is excess production most often. You know, there are places like Cal State LA that are producing their own fuel, but there aren't enough of those. Uh, we're using for the, mo the majority of the network excess production from other applications, mostly industrial. And that's a challenge because we're already seeing we're, we're the last in line uh, for that fuel and there's not enough of it. The good news is we're seeing new production facilities be announced and these are big investments of hundreds of millions of dollars. So that's good. They see the opportunity in future markets. And in mobility, we're the kind of the sexy front runner and we'll, we'll get that first fuel for a while. But I think something you hit upon is we're going to quickly be overtaken by some of these other markets, you know, cement production or even grid renewable um, hydrogen storage for what they're going to need, um, where hydrogen will complement the electric grid. And I, I believe with what I see is we will be the, the front runner at the beginning, but as other applications start to see opportunities, um, we will all compete for it. And their use is so great that we may find ourselves back in a position of, of fighting for the scraps and leftovers. Thank you for sharing. Um, I have one more question myself before we let the, the floor open for the, um, the audience here. Um, I'm looking uh, also that um, uh, so far, at when I'm following the hydrogen uh, development, I've seen different standards comes and goes, and different also pressures, and if it's liquefied or not, 300 bar or four, uh, 700 bar or 350 bar and, or liquefied uh, uh, hydrogen. Do you have any ideas for if there are going to be one standard or if it's a multiple possibility for the different uh, alternatives? Or what, what is the trend right now for the standards for the hydrogen stations? Well, uh, it's uh, <coughs> so uh, our station is built with capability of providing 350 bar and uh, 700 bar. In reality, we fuel at a little bit higher <coughs> pressures up to 820 bar, and then the pressure settles uh, and cools off uh, back to 700 or so. 
but um, uh, 350 bar was created for buses and the heavy duty vehicles uh, of yesteryear. And so what I see uh, a lot of manufacturers are realizing if it uh, 700 bar works for um, uh, passenger vehicles, it will work for heavy duty vehicles. And so that's uh, my vision is that uh, the 350 bar experiences will now move up to 700 bar and that's what we're gonna see in heavy duty and bus applications in the future. Bill? Have you seen anything built from the liquefied uh, part? Is it that out of the question now, liquefied and um, hydrogen for the uh, road-based sector? I think for the foreseeable future, we are going to see just the, the H35 and H70 um, in order to get the market moving. Um, anything, it, too much change like that would, would disrupt any, uh, really all the global markets, and I don't see any change in the near future. However, um, two things could happen. As you mentioned, the, the liquid, and we've seen some like BMW and others really promote that, that there's a lot of sense to that down the line as we really advance these technologies because right now they are, they're like the iPhone 2. You know, that's where we are. And if you think about those first cellular phones compared to where we are, I do believe there's a great opportunity for either liquefied or seeing the 700 pressure move down to 350 as a norm, which is cheaper and easier uh, because I think the technology will advance. I don't know which way yet. Um, but I, I'm pretty confident one way or another, one of those two will likely happen or something similar. Uh, just because if you compare cell phones today versus then, I think you're going to see the same in any technology development. I think I have a few more words to say. Well, I had a time mm -hmm. to think about yeah. <laughs> a little bit more. Um, so with the uh, liquid hydrogen, uh, we pay 30% energy cost. And so I'm, I'm thinking that it could be more of a niche applications rather than a mass market first. Uh, could be in shipping or in uh, uh, some aviation applications that it will take place. Um, but uh, you know, BMW did have a hydrogen station with liquid hydrogen that's possible to build, but I don't know. I, I don't know. I, I'm not sure it will be ready for uh, mass market yet for a while. Then we open up for questions from the audience. Anyone around here? Yes, please. We have a microphone circulating here, so please go ahead. Tell your name first. Thank you. Hi. I was just curious, you know, in terms of, of meeting the goal of really having, you know, consumer uh, cars, you know, you know, driving the fuel cell car market, wh whether you see one of the manufacturers really coming out with a vehicle that kind of captures the the consumer's imagination. You know, I think, you know, in earlier adoptions of these alternative technologies, you know, for a while it was the Prius. It was really cool to have a Prius. And, you know, now it's kind of really cool to have a, a Tesla. Do you see one of the car manufacturers, you know, coming out with a vehicle that people, a fuel cell vehicle where people say, yeah, I really want one of those? Yeah. I get excited about all of them being hydrogen. <laughs> 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 Not that many, but, uh, uh, Mercedes-Benz had a vehicle recently developed. Uh, they actually did a world drive um, quite a few years back. That was a cool vehicle. Uh, Hyundai came out with the uh, Nexa. I really like uh, Honda vehicles as well. Uh, Clarity, you know, you sit inside and it looks like a spaceship. So, so they always kind of uh, knock the ball out of the ballpark. Um, but um, generally, we are looking at cars that are cars, they look like cars, uh, and uh, they drive us, and that's what is important is the quality of experience. And that's what Bill was talking about. It's, you know, with the hydrogen right now, is uh, building uh, reliability into the hydrogen network, and that will provide good experience for the drivers, and then it will be good for hydrogen. It's not just fancy looking car. Can you drive it and have a good experience? Yeah, I'd agree with that. And I'd say the thing that, that what you might be remarking and noticing is these early vehicles, which are in low production volumes and being used around the world, um, need to be 
globally acceptable. So if you look at the first, whether it was the Prius or in Toyota's case, the first Mirai, it was a, a sedan that would work in, in the US, in Europe, in Asia. So it kind of becomes a least common denominator uh, versus say an SUV or something else. And I think as they start to increase volume and as they start to need to be much more competitive against each other, uh, I think in the Nexo, um, you start to see the new uh, designs starting to really do what you're saying, which is, I think, let's let's create, and I'll use Tesla as the example of the really sexy new thing. The new Mirai is trying to get there. Um, the difference being Tesla has a startup mentality and goes that way faster than a traditional vehicle company, which really is looking at how to, in the long run, make a car that can make a, uh, a network of technology and vehicles that, that can succeed over time. And so I think you're gonna see more of that. Um, and I hope we see more of that in the next two years, I think we're going to see a ton of new announcements from automakers. So we have another question in front here. Sure, my name is Lara Fowler and uh, in the United States, I work at Penn State. I, here in uh, Sweden working with Uppsala University on water, but a thread of my research is on energy. So I have a ton of questions, but I'm gonna ask two that are a little bit different. One is how much does it cost to actually fill a car? Um, what does that look like? And then my second question gets to the larger, California with its low carbon fuel standards is looking at the ultimate life cycle of energy. And what's the actual life cycle in zero emissions? You talked about tying it to renewable energy. Is there not an opportunity to use these hydrogen stations effectively as de facto storage for the excess energy that is sometimes going through the California system. Um, so does it solve a battery problem that California is also struggling with? So a simple question and a more complex question. Uh, Bill, you take first question. I'll take maybe a little bit on the second one. <laughs> sure, and, and, and da Dave, David runs a station, so he may know uh, more on on some of the cost things, but the, the fuel price right now is about $15 a kilogram, which is uh, probably three times the cost of gasoline over here. It's probably more competitive over there in Europe because we have exceedingly low gasoline prices. Uh, and because of these early costs being so high, the automakers are paying for the fuel uh, for all of their users. They give you a a credit card that works at all the hydrogen stations. Um, so that's the way they're taking care of that for now. They don't want to do that in the long run. And that's why we're focusing on scale in order to bring the cost down so we can get out of that position. I will say when you, you talk about the low carbon fuel standard, it does take into account, I, I believe they call it the CI or the carbon intensity. And I think it's cradle to grave, not cradle to cradle meaning they do not look at, say, uh, lithium supplies or some of the other issues that may come up with manufacturing of batteries or fuel cell stacks. Uh, but they are, I think it's a pretty good program and probably going to get more robust as we learn more over time. And we are looking at that excess storage. In fact, I can tell you this week, I was traveling around the last few years, the utilities here have essentially blocked hydrogen actively uh, from some of the conversations and, and issues. But as the renewable requirement has gone uh, up to 100%, I had several of them seek me out to, to talk about hydrogen as storage, uh, electrolyzers as grid resiliency uh, methods. And they are starting to see how in the larger renewable penetration, they must have hydrogen. Um, and so I think we're going to see more progress in both of those from the carbon intensity over time and, and cradle to grave to cradle to cradle, as well as renewable penetration and what that means. Yes. Yeah, so from my perspective, from um, low carbon fuel credits, uh, they apply in a variety of ways. So you can be a generator of hydrogen or you can be generator of um, renewable energy. So you get credits for that or you can be operator of a fleet of renewable or zero emission vehicles and get credits for that. So there is a both uh, incentives on the user side and on the generation side. Um, and uh, I think uh, Department of Energy right now is looking at those uh, aspects in terms of encouraging 
uh, hydrogen storage um, for uh, electricity. Um, and one of my slides was uh, uh, with the hydrogen competition, uh, the student competition, and that was specifically power to gas. Uh, so there is an interest in the industry. Uh, we also have another organization, uh, California Hydrogen Business Council. Uh, they discuss quite a bit of that uh, angle. So, uh, however, I know only one study, the member of California Fuel Cell Partnership, University of California, Irvine, uh, they did a study uh, together with a company called Sempra, that they're a gas uh, utility company in California that would uh, respond to, see, in order to absorb that electricity from the grid, you need a signal from California ISO, uh, the, the, the grid independent uh, operator that uh, turn on your electrolyzer. So that's uh, still kind of a, a very preliminary work. We're just only talking about, you know, so we need more of that uh, real, real projects to go, to go live, and I think DOE is funding some of that right now. So time is flying, so just one short more question, otherwise we end the session. Anyone that dares to ask a short question and then a short answer. So for the streamers that we yeah, need the I'm from the United States. No, okay. I was born in Russia. Yeah, you were educated. born in Russia. <laughs> yeah, but you probably know, uh, I, yeah, again, I take the question. Uh, yes. Russia is the biggest uh, producer of natural gas in the world. And as we talked about before, what's going on there? Do you have anything, you know, to tell about the uh, outside the United States? Do you know anything about what's going on in Russia in the, in the field of, or is it zero? Do you mean supply potential of the exactly. natural gas for yeah. producing the hydrogen? That's right. Or maybe it's just zero. It's if I take my chances because you have a background there. Uh, all right. Um, so um, Russia right now investing quite a bit in uh, uh, kind of a Silicon Valley of Russia, Skolkova. Uh, and so there is a, like all kinds of things are happening there. Um, I th what I see right now is a significant interest in uh, solar. Uh, and various, various small plants are, and, and there is a larger plants as well, the solar generation plants that are opening. Uh, but the country is uh, majorly driven by natural gas. So, so it's, it's, it, it's going to be a while before we turn that ship. And uh. please continue <laughs> to discuss uh, after, because what happens next is that we will all gather outside. It should be arranged with drinks and something to eat for everyone there. So, thank we you end Bill. this session Great with a big applause. And thank you so much for joining, Bill. Thank you. Have outside. a great evening. Or yeah, more, with yes, a few squeaks evening. in the wheel, we got it working. <laughs> All right, thank you, Bill. Bye. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you, Maria. We need to take a photo. Oh, you need to take a photo.